Maya Angelou wrote, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And so many of us were able to rise because of inspirational words like that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is so good to see all of you and to see again people we haven't seen since weddings and births and early childhood and foot homes around the corner and University of Tennessee Knoxville and First Baptist Church Lauderdale and Booker T. Washington High School. Oh my goodness, Miss Ishmael's over in foot homes where we used to have activities. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ingrid, Wagin, you all stand up. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Wave your hand in the air. Wave like you don't care. We are so thank all of the staff, employees, the team here at the Cornelia Crenshaw Library. We're live and in living color, in technicolor, here at the beautiful, beautiful, oh my goodness, this, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed because as a little kid, I would walk from the foot, the foot homes is gone. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. South. What is it called now? South City. Foot Park in South City. South City. South City. The whole area is South City, but Foot Homes is called Foot Park and South City. Well, welcome to Foot Homes and South City. Foot Park. Foot Park. My, our apartment was right around the corner and I could just walk up here at any time and enjoy myself in the library. Look at all these books. I wonder how many I read, but I do remember reading many, many biographies. I loved biographies of Booker T. Washington and Abraham Lincoln, because I felt like if Abraham Lincoln could walk all those miles, remember back when we were in segregated schools, there was no busing, and we walked to school during the snow, the rain. We had galoshes, we had rain boots, we had umbrellas. There were no snow days. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. And 38126 has been just dear to my heart. L let me tell you how this book originated. Out of the blue, I didn't think I was going to retire so early. But um, out of the blue, and the smell of popcorn brings up this story. I was leaving near our human resources director's office. I was working at Rockingham County government. And uh, that's where we popped all of our popcorn. And she loved popcorn that was burnt, burnt. And I liked popcorn with no butter and no salt, and nothing on it. And we were laughing about our differences. As I walked back to my office and started writing a press release, I distinctly heard the Lord say to me, it's time to go. And I know my preacher friend out here, I know you know what I mean. It's time to go. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I, I really wasn't ready to go. I was enjoying that paycheck. And um, I'm scared to uh, argue with God and I sat down right then, changed the press release, and wrote my resignation letter to my bosses. And they thought I was teasing or joking, and they thought I was going to leave at the end of the fiscal year, which would have been um, the end of June, June 30th, 2022. And I told them no. Then they said, oh, you're going to leave December 31st, 2021. I said, no, I'm leaving now. And so I retired, I went home, and it was very different because I am a busy, busy person who is always on roller skates. And I was sitting there one day thinking, I, I mean, I can't deal with this. Uh, and, and the soap operas are fine. Hey, they helped to pay my paycheck when I worked in television. But I could not see myself watching soap operas all day and uh, game shows. And I, oh, you don't like doing that either. I understand you've been retired longer than me. And so I sat down at my laptop and I just started typing. And it was almost like God was saying, I want you to write this. 
I didn't even know what this was. Mm -hmm. And I kept writing and writing and I had some other things I had written earlier and it came to my mind, 38126, King's Kids. And this last part of the book, Nobody Said We Were Poor, has resonated no matter where I live, where I go. When you meet people at workshops and seminars and you start talking about back in the day and our back in the day food, when we could afford oxtails. And now oxtail, a little bitty package of oxtails, $25. And, and don't you remember when we could buy oxtails and all these delicacies uh, with hardly any money, but things have changed so much. I don't know how many of you all remember riding the buses. Well, really, we walked almost everywhere because we didn't have enough money to ride a lot of buses, but we walked everywhere, the number two walker, and when we rode the bus, no, no, number two walker was me and dear, me and dear walking down. We walked from here to Beale Street every day to my uncle's office because we didn't have daycare. My mama was working. You all remember uh, Goldsmiths? Uh -huh. My mom worked at Goldsmiths, but she worked in the Cavalier. It was a restaurant. Now, how many of you all were able to go to the Cavalier? See what I'm saying? And um, if we got on the bus to go to our, my grandmother's parents' house, which was be behind Lemoyne on College, and we would ride the number four Walker. It's still the number four Walker. And y'all know me. I was really vivacious and bubbly. And uh, I'm just going to run on, get on the bus, sit, try to sit down up front. My grandma would just grab me and pull me to the back. Yeah. And then um, on Thursdays, that was always a big day because that's the days that you could go to the zoo or go to the fair or go to the symphony, go to the circus. The other days, we couldn't go. Colored people couldn't go. And then when we went on Bill Street, where I was every day, we could just walk in and out and just buy whatever we wanted to buy, try on hats. But when we got on Main Street, we were not able to try on the hats. And uh, of course, the water fountains, they were marked white and colored. And I wrote in the book, I thought colored meant Kool-Aid, I didn't know, but I could read, I could read. Um, it, it was, life was very different, very, very different. So so this book, and, and I'm very thankful for this book, and the first book that I wrote, Faith Over Fear, uh, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason and the Church of God in Christ. And what I did was just shorten my dissertation and take out all those scholarly big words and principles to make something much shorter for people to read about, to let them see the challenges. When you think about the Church of God in Christ, and it is now the largest uh, predominantly black Pentecostal holiness denomination in the country. And we have churches, you know, in, in dozens and dozens of countries. But when you think that they started off with sharecroppers and started off with people who didn't have a lot of skills, who didn't have a lot of learning, but had a lot of burning. And because of all that he had gone through, he was able to teach people using the same leadership skills that I had to go and work on for three years to get a PhD. And I'm thinking, how did he know all this stuff? He got it all from the Bible. But back to this book, Nobody Said We Were Poor, uh, 38126 Kings Kids. Every book that is sold, all of the money goes to support scholarships. And so far, all of the scholarships that we have given have gone to um, four-year schools, universities, uh, two-year schools in North Carolina, plus Hampton University in Virginia. But it has been a real blessing to kids. And the reason why I thought about it was because as a young person, uh, matriculating at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, we didn't always have a lot of money, right? Yep. And sometimes we would be waiting on those, uh, those special boxes with the sardines and the saltines and the Vienna sausages and the potted meat. But oftentimes I was not able to buy the books that I needed. And it was only by the grace of God or by other students who needed to sell their books 
so they could do something else that I was able to get my books. So primarily that's what we're using this, these books sales to help students so they can do what they need to do in their colleges and universities. And hi, I'm Rebecca Madlock Hutchinson. And I was raised at on Mississippi Boulevard, right across the street from the fire station. I went to George Avenue, no, excuse me. I went to the Foot and Claiborne Homes Kindergarten and I graduated from there. And I didn't know that Miss Ishmael's name was Miss Ishmael because as children, we called her Miss Ishmael. <laughs> so I have history too. And my grandmother who um, lived on St. Paul and my parents as a young couple lived on St. Paul until I came along and they moved into to Foot Homes and then we moved into, and then my brother came along, then we moved into a two bedroom apartment across on Mississippi Boulevard. So, and my mother who just passed away and we'll be funeralizing her on Saturday was 93. And she is, she was a proud member of the alumni of the class of 1947 BTW. So I've heard about all the lessons and Mrs. Mary Cole was my first grade teacher at George Avenue. My classroom was on the first floor on the corner on the George Avenue side. I see it every day. So that's my history. And I, yes, I grew up at Metropolitan Baptist Church. My grandparents were the first couple married by Reverend S.A. Owen. My parents were married at Metropolitan. I was married at Metropolitan. We grew up there and my history has been, I guess I feel like I have come full circle because I did not know that of course I would be married to a pastor of First Baptist Church Lauderdale right in front of the elementary school that I went to and then that I would found a community development corporation called SCORE which serves this very neighborhood and SCORE stands for South City a community of opportunity, revitalization, and empowerment. And Ms. Inger over here is the president of our board of directors. So we serve, thank you. So we serve this neighborhood. And I am proud to be able to say that I have this type of history. And you are truly right to say that we must share our history and tell our story because if we don't, somebody else will, and it's not going to be right. right. Amen. And so it is incumbent upon us to share with our children what that story is all about. Amen. And so as I work in this community and I engage with the residents of this community and I have started a South City Resident Leadership Academy. <laughs> we started that last year, we piloted it last year, and we will be doing it again this year. And so we are providing tools and resources to the residents so that they can understand that the power to impact their community lies within themselves, but it's, you, it's more than just telling them that. You must give them the tools so that they can help to realize that and show them how to use those tools and understand the history. And we will be taking our board of directors on a tour of this neighborhood so that they will understand the history of this community. So I am proud, oh, and one more thing. Ms. Ishmael, I worked with Archie Willis and we will be naming a street after Ms. Ish Ms. Calverta Ishmael that would be right behind us. So I will make sure that when we Name that street, we'll have some type of, of celebration and unveiling, and then you will know about that. Thank you. When I first started teaching school, you could ask the kids in the first and second grade, what would you like to be when you grow up? They would tell you a policeman or a fireman. Ask these kids now. They can't tell you. They cannot tell you anything looking at TV every day with all the jobs and all the things that they possibly could do. They can't tell you. I don't know. But I say to myself, 
the the parents today would be if I had children would be one of my children. Somewhere we dropped the ball. I don't know where. Somewhere we dropped the ball. And I do know that uh, a mother and father being in the household, I do realize that because my dad was there and all that you all talked about, we didn't know we were poor because we had everything that everybody living around us had. And your dad did provide for you. But there's somewhere we dropped the ball and as you said, I am working with the group over at the Renaissance with uh, Marlon Foster. We go over and teach etiquette classes to young people. That's great. But they, it, it, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. I wish I did. A good evening, everybody. I, I was compelled to come up here this time. And the reason why I say that is, uh, I just talked to Miss Williams a minute ago. If we don't do whatever it takes to get these children upward bound, to corral them into a spirit of we can, then I know where they will be, where I have made my living for the last 30 years. I'm a bail bondsman. I get folk out of jail. The products that comes out of these schools and out of these homes and out of these neighborhoods, mm -hmm. if we don't do something with them, the folks downtown will, and I'll continue to make a good living. Mm -hmm. Now that's been making a living mm -hmm. off of other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's bad. We tried several years ago, we used to mentor kids over Booker T. Washington High School. Why? That was my school. Why? Because we had some guys at the time who were very interested. Reverend Melvin Charles Smith came out of the 3106, or oh, 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 21, I mean 26. Herbert Davenport came out a little bit further. He down a lot of their sub. 106. 106. Okay. I came out of 106. I came off of Latham Street. Now, all you talk about the housing projects, to me, that was uptown living. Step up. Because <laughs> I've lived in a three-room shack on Latham Street with a toilet on the back porch with a flusher on top of the, the building. <laughs> now, I was uptown because the folks down the street, they was outside on the ground. So when I found out that I was disadvantaged and poor, I was a sophomore at LeBron College. <laughs> I never realized that. Because like you said, we, we were happy with what we had. We were trained to accept what we have and make the best of it. And this was not the end. We could go further. That was pounded in our heads day after day. Boy, don't you do that. Girl, don't you do that. Keep them dresses down. Boys, keep your pants up. We were taught that here. Now they do what they want to do. Without anyone saying anything to it. So I'm encouraging all of you, find something that you can do to help these children to be better. Because if you don't, not only will myself make a little more money, but I got five boys, and they can take over. <laughs> I'm in Grab Church, and um, I've been here 17 years uh, in Library System 26. Uh, prior to that, teaching, parent educator. So I've been around. And um, when I first was assigned to this library, I'm going to tell you, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy a little bit. Um, my cousin Jane and my sister drove to this library and the first thing they said, who did you piss off? Because it was dilapidated, it hadn't changed in I don't know how many years. We had no grass, 
I couldn't understand why I was so neglected. And then I realized we need some advocacy here. We need some change here. And I started learning about the history through the residents. And they talked about all the greatness. And I kept saying, well, it can be great again. So we started doing a lot of programs. The staff and I tried really hard going out in the neighborhood, working with the kids. We started a program called Real Men Read. And 14 years of that program, we read to almost 14,000 preschoolers. And it was African-American men giving their time one day a week at a child care center or elementary, reading stories, talking about the joy of reading. Not trying to take a test, but reading. And that made a difference on a lot of kids. They have to see it in action. We can talk about it as much as we want, but they got to see it. We work very hard to get kids in, but we need you. We need you to be supportive in every way. Mentoring, financial, giving your time. Ms. Draper just said she will come and volunteer to do an etiquette segment for our first father and daughter tea. And the reason why we're doing father and daughter instead of mother and daughter, we have done mother and daughter in the past, but I'm a daddy's girl. And I know my dad taught me a lot of things. He was a sharecropper. He didn't go to school. You were fortunate. Y'all went to high school. My father couldn't go after third grade because he had to work the farm. And then my mother graduated from uh, Manassas. And I heard all the greatness of Manassas. So that's what I know. I, don't, I know very little about BTW because only one of my uncles, my uncle Carl McKinney, he went to BTW and he became a clinical psychologist and he worked in a juvenile justice system. And what he did was assess a lot of kids who he said were brilliant, intelligent, but he said they didn't have enough guidance, enough love, and he said, the only way things are gonna change, we have to invest in our kids. We talk about it. We want it. It's just not happening. We had a round table luncheon last week. Larche Hoyhana, he's my teen librarian at Gaston Park. I managed two locations this one as well. And Larche was trying to get the pulse of people because we have kids who are dying. We know two kids who died this, you know, a couple of weeks ago in January. Something has to change. We have programs here at both locations that you can participate in. We have brochures of becoming a financial member. It's ways of help. And Mabel and Abel and I, we talk a lot. I remember one time we talked and it was like two hours. And I'm like, I'm at work. You know? <laughs> but we're on the same track. We're on the same mindset. So all I'm saying, we can make a difference if we want to. You want to volunteer here? You want to do anything at either of the locations that I have? You're more than welcome. And you can, uh, I have my business card, and you just call or email me. I'd be, I'd be happy to respond. And maybe, and I'm working with Rebecca. And we have done some great projects, Rebecca and I. Uh, our biggest thing, uh, the last two years because of COVID, we have been working with senior citizens. And last Christmas, we provided over 505 
Christmas stockings to seniors to reduce social isolation and also make sure they know that they're cared about and loved. So there's programs. We just don't get a lot of news. We don't get a lot of information out there that people know what we're doing. But we're doing stuff. It's just it's just kind of like a secret. <laughs> we appreciate all of your support and your support of Amen Communications, Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit. And what we do is publish books in order to take the proceeds and provide monies and scholarships for needy college students, either in two-year programs, four-year programs, universities. And we try to help students in Virginia and in North Carolina. In fact, over the last four years, we've been able to help students in maybe 10 to 12 different universities, colleges, and schools. We hope that we'll expand even more in the future. Thank you so much for your prayers and your blessings.